Well, thanks everyone for coming. The, uh, this, it seems strange to call this a new story since it occurred to me a long time ago and I wrote the first scene and have done readings of the first scene and for many years had no idea what came after the first scene. But this year I finished it, wrote the, the other four-fifths of the story. The Sycamore Hill Writers Conference was instrumental in helping me figure out what I was doing there. Uh, Sydney, my wife, was instrumental in helping me figure it out too. And this will be one of the new stories in the uh, new collection of mine from Small Beer, which will be out in a year uh, with love. The, uh, the title of the collection will be An Agent of Utopia, but the title of this story is Real Indians. And I'll just begin at the beginning because if I skip around, it won't make one lick of sense. Um, see how far I get. In April 1926, my gang was working the 30th floor of the Fred F. French building on 45th Street Midtown, where the Church of the Heavenly Rest used to be. It was a Thursday. Joe Diabo was Riveter, the best I ever saw. I swear that when Joe had the hammer, I could feel it in my knees from 10 feet away and him grinning the whole time. The rest of the gang was Tom Tuax, who was the sticker in, and Orvis Goodleaf, who was the bucker up, and me, Eddie Two Rivers Delisle, which is too many names for anyone, even a Mohawk, even a Kahnawaga Mohawk. I was the heater, which is why I got to see it when it happened. Since most of you don't go up high unless our work is done, when you have enclosed elevators and carpets and pretty girls behind desks and thick tinted windows and air conditioning and can persuade yourselves you're on the ground nearly, let me explain what our gang was doing that morning. It all started with me. I plucked out of the coals the reddest rivet I could find. If it made the ends of the tongs red too, that was about right. I tossed it ten feet across and three feet down right into Tom's bucket. And Tom winked to say, good going, Eddie. So close to the rivet going plunk that it was like an iron eyelid slamming down. Tom and I had been practicing on the reservation, standing on slippery rocks in the St. Lawrence, me with the bucket and him with the hammer, and then switching ever since we were old enough to see the future. During the pluck, Orvis had yanked out the temporary bolt, so when Tom plucked the rivet out of the bucket, there was the hole in the beam waiting. In went the bolt until the button head was flush with the steel, which meant about an inch of red tip sticking out the other side of the beam, where Joe Diabo was ready with his gun. But he had to wait for Orvis to fit the dolly bar over the button head, brace himself, and yell, Okay! Then Joe Diabo leaned on the hammer until the red tip was smashed out like a second button head. That was what I felt in my knees, what made Joe Diabo grin. He lifted his gun and wiped his forehead. Already the rivet was dulling down to gray. That one ain't going no place, Joe Diabo said. Then it was time to move to the next hole, but Tom and Orvis waited for Joe Diabo to move first. When he shuffled sideways, they shuffled sideways too, on the other side of the beam. The forge and I stayed where we were. You can't just pick up a forge and move it a foot at a time. It's not worth it. I felt comfortable tossing rivets up to about 40 feet, which come to think of it is about the width of the St. Lawrence at Conewaga Village. When Tom and his bucket had shuffled 40 feet away, it was time to move the forge. That meant time for a break, because we also had to move the planks the forge was sitting on. Oh, I forgot to mention the planks. They were your basic two by tens. The forge and I stood on a dozen of them laid across two beams. The other guys in the gang had to make do with three planks on each side of the beam, less room if they tried to stand parallel to it and no room to do anything else, like sit or walk normally. If you wanted to take a stroll, you used one of the beams, which compared to the planks, 
felt like the sidewalk on Fifth Avenue. As I said, we were working the 30th floor. There were other gangs above and below. If I looked up or down, not that I had the time, I saw two dozen men in each direction getting smaller and smaller, like reflections in a department store mirror, their jackets ballooning out in the wind. A girl once made me take her to a pirate movie. Those pirates climbing the sails with their shirts rippling. Yeah, I told her. That's what my job is like. She popped her gum and said, They don't make movies about rivet gangs, Eddie Two Rivers, Delisle. And she was right about that. Joe Diabo lifted the gun and wiped his forehead. That one ain't going no place. They were about 40 feet away. Before Joe Diabo could shuffle sideways, I yelled, Break time! After we moved the platform and the forge, we took five, sitting on the beam and smoking. Tom and Orvis and I let our feet dangle, but Joe Diabo sat with his legs folded, his feet in his lap, like one of the old timers. Maybe he was pretending he was sitting on the ground, I don't know. We were from the same village, but only Joe Diabo was one of the longhouse people, the followers of the old ways. He didn't talk about it much. We didn't talk about anything much when we were in high steel, and that was the only place I ever hung out with Joe Diabo. He was older than the rest of us and had left Conewaga when I was a kid, and I don't recall ever having a conversation with him on the ground. Tom was Catholic, and Orvis, well, I don't remember what Orvis was. Nothing, probably. And us Delisles were Presbyterian. But I doubt any of us were thinking of religion that morning when Al, the rivet boy, clambered into view, his helmet down over his eyes nearly. Get them while they're hot, Mr. Eddie, he said, watching Al trot along the beams, the one-strap sack swaying at his side. You'd think he was delivering the times and not 30 pounds of rivets. Thank you, Al, I said, lifting the sack off his shoulder. His jacket was plastered to his thin frame with sweat. Al turned to Orvis and asked, Got a smoke? Orvis already had three cigarettes in hand. He gave two to Al, who pocketed one and wedged the other into the corner of his mouth, then leaned forward, squinting for Orvis to light it. It was a ritual. Al hardly flinched at all now when Orvis's flaring match neared his face. You got a big weekend planned, Alphonse? Orvis asked. Al winced. He hated his full name, but was too small to fight about it. Big enough, he said. Coughing, he pulled from another pocket a ragged patch of newsprint. Pop and I are going to the movie premiere. Here, take a look. I looked at the advertisement. A spraddle-legged, buckskin-wearing white man with a flamboyant mustache fired his pistols into the letter O of The Flaming Frontier, mightiest of thrillers, a glorious epic of America's last wilderness, the last word in great westerns with this great assembly of stars, Hoot Gibson, Ann Cornwall, Dustin Farnham as Custer. Be the first in New York to experience the flaming frontier. Midnight, Saturday, April 3, 1926, Colony Theater. I don't know, Al, I said, exchanging a look with the others. That's pretty late for you to be out. Says who, Al snarled, right on cue, and we all laughed. Al was older than he looked, I guess, in some ways. We'd all heard Papa Denunzio was a bad drunk and mean. The others passed his paper around. Custer, huh, Tom said. Joe Diabo pointed to the mighty figure. Looks like he wins this time. Hoot Gibson, Tom said. Is he the one who runs up to the back of the horse and jumps on? That's him, Al said. Papa used to jump onto a horse just like that. So he says, in the old country before the war, Orvis laughed. Not much call for trick riding on a beer wagon, is there, Al Fox? Al flushed, and I took the paper out of Orvis's hands. 
Don't listen to him, Al, I said. Here, you go. You have a good time. Al shook his head. You all missed the interesting part. Take another look, Mr. Eddie. Look at the small print. I looked and read aloud. Real Indians needed for paying work associated with this premier. Bonuses paid for authentic clothing, weapons, etc. Contact Ian Birnbaum, Colony Theater box office. Real Indians, Artis said. I'll be damned, what are they going to do? Stage a massacre at intermission? <laughs> Tom looked around at the girders, the forge, the lunch buckets, the skeleton of the Chrysler building down the way. Thanks for telling us, Al, but when they say real Indians, I don't think they mean us. Joe Diabo looked thoughtful, but he didn't say anything. I returned Al's paper, and he went on his way, and we went back to work. My turn to rivet, Tom said, reaching for the gun. Joe Diabo sounded startled. No, no, not, not yet. Let me. I'm good till lunchtime. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Just getting warmed up. Orvis was trying to look unconcerned, but I knew this was just fine with him. He never wanted to rivet. it. He would be the sticker in all day if he could. But Tom was more ambitious. Tom looked to me for help, and I disappointed him by saying, we did have a great rhythm going there. Sure we did, Joe Diabo said. Let's get to it, boys. Okay, Tom said, and that was it. No big deal. Sometimes we rotated jobs after a break, sometimes we didn't. And in the high steel, what Joe Diabo wanted, Joe Diabo got. So that was that. I keep telling myself. I said earlier that being the heater gave me the best vantage point. That was because neither Tom nor Orvis could see anything but the top of Joe Diabo's head on the other side of the beam and their attention was fixed on the rivet anyway. But me, I could see both sides of the beam equally well, with nothing to do but wait for the time to toss the next rivet. Usually I watched Joe Diabo, who was a master, as I said. I watched him flatten the next rivet and the next and the next, and then I watched him lift the gun, wipe his forehead, say, that one ain't and step backward off the planks into the air. Why? Who knows why? When I was a kid, I heard an old, old man, one of the nail keg crowd at Montour's store, tell about his son, also a riveter, who fell from the Sioux Bridge in 1890. Who knows why he fell, the old man said. It happens. Sometimes you just get in the way of yourself. That old man's gone now, but his successors sit around Montours to this day, talking about Joe Diabo. Some of them say he did it on purpose. I guess any sort of notion is interesting to think about when you have nothing to do but sit on the side of the highway watching the tourists speed past you toward Montreal and hoping your old buddy on the bench next to you has not noticed that you've peed your pants again. But I was there. I watched his expression as he realized what he had done, Joe Diabo, who had walked to the beams and the planks for 30 years. It was the same expression that Orvis, for Christ's sake, Orvis got every Saturday night when the latest in a long line of bruisers got tired of his lip and proceeded to knock the shit out of him. And Orvis just standing there watching it come, marveling at his own folly. That's what I saw in Joe Diabo's face, and worse yet, he saw that I saw it. As he stepped back, he looked at me, still open-mouthed from the eight, and without thinking, I looked away, looked down into my pan of hot coals, but not quickly enough. He saw my face all right, what did he see there to carry down with him? One of the coals tumbled sideways and flared red as Joe Diabo screamed. 
Don't ask me what he said. Oh sure, those of us in the steel that day were mostly Mohawk, and we recognized Mohawk when we heard it. And make no mistake, everyone heard it. In the steel, a scream like that, you halfway listen for it all day, and when it comes, you're ready. But not one of us, it turned out, followed the old ways. We grew up speaking French or English with some Mohawk thrown in as needed. If you wanted your mother to make you some Kanatharok, for example, you had to say it in Mohawk. There was no English word because English folks didn't boil their bread. They baked it. Those everyday Mohawk words I knew. But whatever Joe Diabo screamed at the end, it was not an everyday word. Some people want to make a joke of it. Say maybe it was an old Mohawk curse word. Horseshit to that. But Joe Diabo wasn't talking to us anyway. We came down, of course. No more work that day. The construction companies are good about that. Also, they think falls might be catching. White people are superstitious that way. Tom and Orvis went ahead carrying their lunch buckets with the sandwiches that never tasted as good on the ground. But I had to dampen the coals, fasten the cover and the flue for the night, and so on. I was always more painstaking at these tasks than the others. I mean, Arvis, forget it. Plus, I was slower than usual on account of not crying. Mohawk men don't cry, but not crying is hard work sometimes. It takes all your concentration. So I thought I was the last one on our level, the tail end of the goat, my grandmother would say, though she would have said it in Mohawk. But as I set foot on the ladder, I saw a figure sitting alone, way on the other side of what would be the 30th floor, but was now mostly air. I walked over afraid that Al would be crying too, but no, he just sat there looking out at the city. I sat too. My feet dangled alongside his. I asked, did you see it? He shook his head. Me neither, I said. I would have put my arm around him, but his sack of rivets was in the way. This happens sometimes, I said. Not often. Maybe not again for ten years. But it happens. Yeah. Got a smoke? Al asked, his voice shaky. I didn't smoke, and he knew that, but it was something to say. Let's go down now, I said. Okay, he said. For the first time since the accident, for the first time in my life, I didn't want to be in the steel. I wanted to be on the ground. The feeling would pass, would rarely come back, but I felt it then. Al went first, leading the way. I carried the rivets. Without them, Al was so small, the ladder wasn't even vibrating when I took hold of it. It was as if he weren't there. Rattling down in the elevator, we watched the city rise around us. As we descended into shadow, it got colder. The car shook like a buckboard, so we braced ourselves against the walls. I turned to Al and said, let me see that advertisement again. He handed it to me, and I read it over. Colony Theater, I said. I know where that is. I saw a pirate movie there once. Al sounded excited. Are you going, Mr. Eddie? Why not, I said. They're looking for real Indians, aren't they? I drew myself up, jabbed my thumb into my chest. 100% real Indian. That's me. I'm going to do something I've never done before, and I'm going to skip ahead to just a very brief bit of the end of the story. Most of the story is at the premiere. That's the bulk of it. And everything that happens to Eddie there and who he meets and the strange adventures he has. But at the end, you go back to work. 
That Monday morning after the premiere, I was back in the steel. I was early. If I had anything to work out with myself about being up there again, I wanted to do it alone. As one floor after another dropped past the elevator, I took deep breaths, bounced my lunch sack against my leg in a steady rhythm. Clearing the neighboring buildings into the light of the sunrise warned me, and the higher I went, the better I felt. I felt back to normal when I shoved open the door and stepped off the elevator. There was no one else on 30. Oh, Joe Diabo was waiting for me all right, as I half expected he would be, but he wasn't on my floor. He was about 10 feet west of it, beyond the farthest beam, farther out than anyone in the Fred F. French building has reached to this day. He was hanging in the air above Fifth Avenue at eye level with me. I knew he was standing on nothing because nothing was out there to stand on, but I still wanted to look down at his feet, see if his toes were pointing toward fifth, like toes on a crucifix. I fought that urge. I didn't want to look in that direction. I just looked him in the eye. Joe Diabo spoke to me, but too faintly to hear. Part of me wanted to step closer to hear him better, but I was already farther toward the edge than I wanted. Somehow I had left behind the platform in front of the elevator, and I had stepped onto the beam. I kept looking into Joe Diabo's eyes, because I knew if I looked away for a second, when I turned back around, he might be closer, a lot closer. And then I'd get in the way of myself for sure. So I held his gaze as I slowly sat down on the beam and hooked my right arm around the nearest support, which was one of the struts of the forge. The sharp edge against my bicep woke me up a little. Joe Diabo's eyes were the saddest I ever saw. He spoke again, and now the wind was toward me, off the Hudson. I caught a whiff of fish in the breweries in Union City, and I could hear his voice now, thin and far away. It wasn't English. I'm sorry, Joe, I said, though he was still talking. I can't understand you. I wish I could. I wanted to say more to tell him about that Saturday night Wild West minstrel show I'd been to, but the funny thing was, the longer I listened to Joe's voice, the better I understood it. I'm not sure it ever turned into English, not entirely, but it turned into something I could understand. I'm sorry, Eddie. I'm so sorry. Say it's all right, Eddie. I actually laughed. Well, it wasn't quite a laugh. It was more like the sound Orvis makes when he's punched in the gut, all the air leaving at once. Sorry for what, Joe? You got nothing to be sorry for. I'm sorry I failed, Joe said. But I was good, wasn't I, Eddie? Except for that. I did a good job before, didn't I? That's where I'll stop. <laughs> they all turn out to be ghost stories. Don't they? <laughs> Questions? Comments? Objections? Is that going to appear somewhere? It's going to be in the uh, small beer collection, which will be out in the next year, I guess. The title of the collection is An Agent of Utopia. We didn't want to title it Real Indians, because <laughs> the other stories aren't about real Indians. Of course, the other stories aren't about agents of utopia, either. <laughs> but we're just stuck on that title. Um, that story is about, uh, well, that story had helped to go to the Tower of London in, uh, this summer for Worldcon. Mm -hmm. So, um, thank you all for coming. I guess we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you.